Hobbes believed uh, that there's no highest good. Science cannot explain human behavior. There's no such thing as natural kindness. Or we can imagine new ideas that are not derived from sensation. Um, half of you got this one right. What's the answer? A. 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 Right. He thinks there's no such thing as highest good. Um, nobody thought that B. Science. The whole point is to try to have a science that explains human behavior. A bunch of you thought that there's no such thing as natural kindness. But there is. He explicitly mentions this on page 10. I talked about that passage. We also talked about this in connection with whether Hobbes was his uh, psychological egoist. means and ends here. Um, what's the right answer here? So we can A, B, C, or D, we can rationally assess. So the <coughs> rational assessment of means, ends, both, or D. C, so we can rationally assess means, but not ends. So uh, ends are made good simply by the fact of somebody for somebody, simply by the fact of their desire. So there's no rational assessment of that. It's either something that there is a desire for or not. There's no good reason for it or bad reason for it. It just is or isn't. And so this is an empirical fact that we discover about people that they have a certain aversion or desire for certain things. There's no assessment possible of that. However, that is, that fact of desire is what makes it good or bad for them. On the other hand, once we've established that there is a desire for some end, once we've established that some end is good for them, then we can see whether they are taking rational and effective means to achieve that. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. If they're not, then there's a failure of some kind. There's a kind of rational deficiency in their pursuit of their end. Um, that was the um, plurality view, but not quite half. Uh, according to Hobbes, the will, um, mostly two thirds of you got this, is the last desire or aversion before an action. It does exist. It can be given a scientific explanation. Um, and it's not found only in human beings, it's found in any kind of creature that. Okay, and the last, right, so the last one was about the state of nature, um, which was assigned in the reading, but we hadn't talked about it yet. The answer is which, according to Hobbes, the state of nature would be mostly peaceful. The people in the state of nature would be divided into two groups, the strong and the weak. People would be able to satisfy their desires easily, or none of the above. None of the above. Certainly, it's not useful to sit for all of us all. I don't know, maybe B, a few of you found tricky. Um, no, there's no groups in the state of nature. So, in the state of nature, um, it would be a state of all against all. Furthermore, there's not going to be a division between the strong and the weak. We're all relatively equal. That's why I ended up picking A, because I picked not thinking about like the state of war kind of concept in my head. I was just thinking of the equality concept, uh -huh. and I ended up picking that. Well. Right. Um, but it would be a state of war yeah. of all against all. Uh, and the crucial implication is that people would not be able to satisfy their desires easily. That people would all find it bad 
in the technical sense that Hobbes talks about those kinds of evaluations. Okay? So, not a good So we wound up last time um, talking about his argument about the state of nature. Let me try to summarize the argument for his conclusion that the state of nature would be a state of war. Um, and it's important, and we sort of wound up mentioning this, that Hobbes Hobbes' argument is not, based, is not based on the claim that human nature is inherently evil or bad. Um, he argues that there would be insecurity and conflict because of something like for the following reasons. So first of all, um, his subjectivism. There's nothing intrinsically good or bad, um, but things are made good or bad by the fact of somebody desiring them. That is made good or bad for that person by the fact that that person desires or has an aversion. Second, our desires change over time and come into conflict with one another. Um, there's some degree of maybe moderate scarcity. And I want to make sure we're clear what it means for desires to conflict with one another. Um, because maybe on a superficial uh, analysis of the words, you might not see this. So if you, I mean my, my uh, little toy example was you have a desire for a coconut, and I have a desire for that same coconut. We both can't enjoy it. There's limited resources available to satisfy our desire. On the one hand, it may, on a superficial analysis, look as though we both think the coconut is good. It might look like there's an agreement about the value of the coconut. You say it's good, and I say it's good. But of course, that's hiding a more substantial conflict. Because when I say it's good, what I really mean is it's good for me to eat it or have it or something like that. Right? I have a desire for it. And what you are saying when you say it's good is that you have a desire for it. And if there's some degree of scarcity, then both of those desires cannot be jointly satisfied. That's what it means for them to conflict. So it looks like we're in agreement that the coconut is good, but in fact, there's a conflict of desires. What I'm really evaluating is, what I really have a desire for and therefore think is good, is my eating it, or having it, or holding it. What you are evaluating is what you have a desire for, and therefore what you have uh, a judgment its value is that your eating it or having it or holding it is good. So they're different. Okay, so the fluid and uncertain nature of our desires means that they are uh, either actually in conflict with one another or there's a chance that they will come into conflict with one another in the future. And in the state of nature, there's no way to resolve these conflicts that I just described, except through the use of force, except through physically taking the thing. This is because, uh, I mean, this is, this is the case that we talked about early on when there's a conflict and Hobbes thinks the only way to resolve this is you know, not to resolve it or to do it physically, or to appoint some third judge who's authorized to decide the case. And that's exactly what's lacking in the state of nature. So there's no other alternative. 
Okay, so uh, there's a constant threat and risk that we will come into physical conflict with others because there's a constant threat and risk that our desires will conflict with theirs and there will be no